Tonight, a SARS-like virus spreads again. More cases, more places, more deaths. China takes a dramatic new step while the World Health Organization decides to wait. What's Canada doing? As long as we keep an eye on it, we should be well prepared. Nurses and doctors on the front line show us how they're preparing. Why Rana Ambrose won't be the next Conservative Party leader. You have so many guilt as a parent. Empathy and advice from one heartbroken family to so many others. Why they now feel abandoned. And a Harvey Weinstein accuser takes a huge risk and talks with us. I certainly didn't go into the job thinking um, he's a serial rapist. She's breaking an agreement not to speak. He's on trial in a New York courtroom. This is The Nation. Confirmation tonight in five countries on two continents. The dangerous coronavirus is on the move and taking more lives. At least 17 people have now died. More than 570 others have been infected. And Chinese officials say thousands more have probably been exposed without even knowing it. Tonight, we'll show you how Canada is preparing its defenses and what lessons were learned from the deadly SARS outbreak of the early 2000s. But let's begin tonight with the efforts to coordinate a global response from Beijing to the World Health Organization headquarters in Geneva. Officials there are watching closely and as Sasha Petrasik reports, still waiting, at least tonight. Our team is on the ground in China as we speak working with local experts and officials to investigate the out outbreak. After a day-long meeting with experts, the head of the World Health Organization calls the coronavirus outbreak an evolving and complex situation, but opted to wait a day before making a decision on declaring a global emergency, as it did do for SARS in 2003. To proceed, we need more information WHO officials today praise China's openness since the outbreak began three weeks ago in the central city of Wuhan, where it is still most concentrated. The suspected ground zero of the outbreak, this now closed seafood market, still under investigation. Wuhan is now effectively locked down. Officials have ordered airports and train stations to close to outgoing passengers, with subways, buses and ferries shut down. And Wuhan residents encourage not to move around at all unless absolutely necessary. It's all to slow the spread of the virus during Chinese Lunar New Year, the busiest travel time of the year. But given how difficult the Wuhan virus is to detect, that may prove tough. Already confirmed in Shanghai, Beijing and Shenzhen, officials in Hong Kong and Macau today confirmed cases as well. And Russia now fears it may soon join Thailand, Japan, South Korea and the United States with confirmed cases of its own after a feverish young traveler returned from Shanghai. Wuhan may be effectively quarantined now, but is that enough with China's mass migration already in full swing elsewhere? Andrew? Right. And, and Sasha, you were speaking with people boarding the trains today in Beijing. What do they say? Well, there's a great deal of worry and frustration. People just aren't sure what they can do to protect themselves against a virus that is so new and unknown and, as the experts were saying here today, already mutating. Sasha Petrosik in Beijing tonight. Thanks. Now, tonight here in Canada, there are no confirmed cases. But with the deadly SARS outbreak in 2003 in mind, Canadian health officials want to be ready. And defences are already being set up. Vicodopia got a tour of the front lines in Toronto. At this emergency department in northwest Toronto, they're not taking any chances. Along with blood pressure and other vital information, questions about foreign travel. Have you traveled outside of Canada in the last 30 days? All of the logistics are mapped out here and we're able to act on each one of them. In the Humber River Hospital's the command really centre, staff monitor the entire facility's vital signs. This new hospital was built with outbreaks in mind. I can't, you know, 
uh, stress enough how incredibly unprepared we were for SARS. This is, we're in a, such a better position now. The hospital's chief of staff was in the thick of the SARS crisis 17 years ago when weak protocols spurred on the spread of the virus. It was about running around and trying to buy respirators. It was around, you know, trying to set up negative pressure rooms and hiring additional screeners and things like that. Those things are kind of baked into our system now. Airports are stepping up screening of international travelers, but they may not show any symptoms during their flights. So hospitals remain at the front lines if the outbreak spreads. It's really important that we isolate those patients right away. At another Toronto hospital, there's a palpable sense of readiness. The emergency department has already dealt with cases that tested negative for the coronavirus. We've had three patients that have come in with a travel history who've presented with these symptoms. They've done a phenomenal job in getting those patients into the appropriate isolation right away. The department manager is another veteran of the SARS crisis. I think people have to appreciate that it's not the same as SARS. It's not presenting the same. It hasn't, the numbers aren't the same. The death rate, the mortality rate's not the same. So um, as long as we keep an eye on it, I think we should be well prepared. Prepared and ready for if tomorrow the WHO declares a new global health emergency. Vicodopia, CBC News, Toronto. Tonight, Quebec health officials are closely monitoring several people who've recently returned from China. They said today that six people have shown signs of a respiratory illness. Five are under observation in Montreal and Quebec City hospitals. The sixth tested negative and was able to go home. We'll bring you updates as we get them. There has been a huge surprise tonight in the race to be the next Conservative Party leader. The woman so many had favoured will not run. Rana Ambrose says thanks, but no thanks. As Hannah Thibodeau explains, that changes everything. I have really struggled with the decision to return to political life. In a minute and a half long video, Rana Ambrose dashed the hopes of many Conservatives across Canada. But right now, I'm focused on making a difference through the private sector. She's faced weeks of immense pressure to run from heavyweights like former Prime Minister Stephen Harper, Alberta Premier Jason Kenney, and former Saskatchewan Premier Brad Wall. But today, I want to thank she finally decided she's out. It is humbling to be considered at all because I love our party, I love the people in it, and I love our country. Without her, it's a race so far with no high-profile Westerner or female candidate. Je ne ferai pas candidat, définitif. Add that to former à Quebec à Premier and Progressive Conservative leader Jean Charest's decision not to run, and suddenly, this is a much different leadership race. Look, not having Mr. Chere, not having Ron Ambrose in the race doesn't make it as exciting. Uh, it would have been great to have them in there. Uh, but the opportunity That's the thinking of many Conservatives, and many now feel it's a three-way race. I mean, look, if you were handicapping it today, it would be a race between three people. Probably right now, Peter McKay would be seen as the favourite. Do not underestimate Pierre Polyev, and don't equally underestimate Aaron O'Toole. Doesn't mean others can't pop up and, and play interesting roles, uh, but right now, today, it's those three candidates. Ambrose was seen by many as the party's best shot to beat the Liberals in the next election. With her decision today, the Conservatives now need to focus all of their attention on who will actually lead that fight. Hannah Thibodeau, CBC News, Ottawa. So, of course, Rosie and that issue will be tackling this story. How is the Conservative race shaping up? They'll be here at the regular time tomorrow. Five tourists from France are missing, and their Quebec guide is dead after their snowmobiles plunged through thin ice. Three other French tourists did manage to escape, and they led police to a spot that locals know to avoid. All of this happening a few hours north of Quebec City, near the town of Saint-Henri-de-Taillon. Alison Northcott explains how it all went wrong. Police on snowmobile combing the shores. The search began last night after the tour group was snowmobiling and some plunged through the ice. Ils ont quitté le sentier fédéré. Quebec Provincial Police Sergeant Hugues Beaulieu says the group had left the designated snowmobile trail. The 42-year-old guide, Benoit L'Espérance, was pulled from the frigid waters but later died. Three others avoided the worst and sought help at a gas station owned by a seasoned snowmobiler. He says the area they were in is known to be dangerous. Everyone knows, says Charles Tremblay, in that area it never freezes. 
but snowmobiling is a big draw. Tens of thousands of visitors come to the province to snowmobile each year. And according to Quebec's coroner's office, at least 20 tourists died in snowmobiling accidents in the last 10 years. Steve St. Chalet says it can be a dangerous sport if you don't take precautions. It's tempting to go outside the trails in those situations. Um, and that's what they're paying for a lot of times to see. So it can become a little little problematic sometimes and obviously we're putting people at risk. In this case, the guide had completed a safety course for group tours 10 years ago. The Quebec Federation of Snowmobile Clubs says that kind of training isn't mandatory, but there are guidelines every snowmobiler should follow. But the main thing to remember, and I can't stress this enough, remain on the state trails. As soon as you venture off, you're taking a risk. Police say the strong currents have made their work harder. Tonight, what? police confirmed they located two snowmobiles in the water. They'll be retrieved tomorrow. Allison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. Well, patience is more than a virtue right now in St. John's. A degree of sanity and safety depends on it on day six of a state of emergency. The city is struggling to find normal, but so much of that record 76 centimeter snowfall just won't get out of the way. To get to supplies and medical care, cars were allowed, making for more than enough traffic to make walking dangerous. We didn't have a lot of sidewalks in the beginning, so it's even less so right now. You just gotta be really careful where you're walking and be ready to jump into a snowbank when the cars are coming. The airport is now open, families reuniting while visitors escape. So you're flying out today? Yes, I'm so excited. <laughs> Hardly slept. <laughs> they take some pretty fond memories with them. Got to experience a hurricane in the snow, so it's pretty sweet. Sweet if you have the luxury of leaving this snow sculpture city. These guests are helping the residents staying behind. We had a full day today. Uh, all the 27 teams that we have are all on the ground answering calls. St. John's will have the military's help until demand for it melts away. So the damage left by the storm is clearer by the day, but the snow didn't always have the courtesy to stay outside. And Chris O'Neill Yates met some home no homeowners who faced an avalanche inside their house. As if being in the dark with no power during a blizzard wasn't enough, add this. And I had just poured, my, poured a water into a cup of tea when there was this big loud crack and a thump. Christina Smith and Chris Brooks live in this postcard perfect area of St. John's. They live in the dark green house on the right. Friday night, their tenant in the adjacent light green one called, saying the house was filled with snow. Yeah. It basically popped the window right out, yeah. the window box and all and then everything in the window box, and then the snow basically came in after that. It came from this cliff behind the house. Normally, the snow fence put there for safety catches the snow, not this time. We're, we're shoveling snow out the door, and I phoned our neighbors and said, look, can you come and help? And the, um, about an hour later, um, we heard voices, and it was the firemen. I mean, they, they appeared like three abominable snowmen. I mean, in the, in the living gale. Fearing more avalanches, they came to help and ended up shoveling out the snow, preventing the potential collapse of the house under the weight of it. Brooke Smith and their tenant trudged to a nearby house for the night. The tenant remains there. After living here for more than 35 years, it'll take more than an avalanche to drive Brooks out. Uh, everybody here is a bit odd, and the place is a bit odd, and, and the charm of it is that it's underneath a cliff. Brooks says he still doesn't feel unsafe here. You don't know how you're going to die. Like, you could be run over by a truck, you know, you, you could get horrible disease, you, could be, you have no idea. I've always said, joking, I know I'm going to die. A dirty big rock's going to come off the cliff and go bang, and I'll be flat. That's it, right? They won't know the extent of the damage until the snow melts. Right now, they're just feeling thankful. Chris O'Neill Yates, CBC News, St. John's. <laughs> and Andrew, I have to say, in, in just getting back from St. John's like uh, a couple <laughs> hours ago, uh, I have to say the snow is going, the stories are not. There are mm. more extraordinary stories of kindness, one of the more special ones. Uh, is coming up in the moment. All right, sounds uh, sounds good. Good to have you back. Oh, thank you. By the way, welcome <laughs> back. Just thank you. Uh, keep keep your papers okay, sorry, on I'll your side. On side. Of the, I got the table, it. If we could. Uh, let's turn to Washington now, where the impeachment trial of the U.S. president finally got underway. Donald Trump himself was thousands of kilometers away at the World Economic Forum in Switzerland, but as Susan Ormiston tells us, he could not resist weighing in. The Senate will now hear you.
The president took a pummeling, the case against, aggressively argued. President Trump withheld hundreds of millions of dollars in military aid to a strategic partner at war with Russia to secure foreign help with his reelection. In other words, to cheat. That's how it went for eight hours, accusing President Trump of cheating, abusing his power, then covering it up after the now infamous call with Ukraine's President Zelensky. The call record revealed a president who used his high office to personally and directly press the leader of a foreign country to do his political dirty work. If left unchecked, says the prosecution team, Trump could do it again in the run-up to this year's election. A president this unapologetic, this lawless, this unbound to the Constitution, must be removed from that office. Outside the chamber, the battle of persuasion. Trump's team okay. saying nothing new here, rehash. Look, they're putting on their case. The good news is we only have 22 hours more to go of their side, and then we'll go. Opinions already hardened. This couple visiting from Louisiana won't even watch. I think it's a waste of time. I think it's a waste of money. I think all of this is just to uh, get Trump out. They never wanted him in, and he, he defeated them. And this is just their payback. President Trump arriving back from Switzerland tonight, teased earlier in the day that he'd love to come to the Senate. I'll sit right in the front row and stare at their corrupt faces. I'd love to do it. The last thing his legal advisors want. What we can't show you inside that Senate chamber is the hundred senators stuck in their seats hour after hour. They can't talk. On pain of imprisonment, there are no cell phones, not even coffee. One senator from Minnesota described it today as like sitting on a tractor. Susan Ormiston, CBC News, Washington. And there were opening arguments today in another case followed by millions. The criminal trial of Harvey Weinstein on charges that include rape and sexual misconduct. Stephen D'Souza shows us how each side intends to sway the jury. The defense tactics may sound familiar. Casting his walker aside, Harvey Weinstein hobbled into court today. Harvey, do you think you're going to get a fair trial today? Yeah. What makes you say that? I have good lawyers. In court, each side painted a very different picture of Weinstein. The prosecution called the Hollywood titan a seasoned predator, a rapist, a manipulator. Assistant District Attorney Megan Hast said the power imbalance he exploited was not just physical, it was professional, and it was profoundly emotional. The prosecution went into graphic detail of the alleged assaults against Mimi Halle when she was a Mirabax assistant in 2006 and named for the first time today aspiring actress Jessica Mann in 2013. Throughout today's opening statements, Harvey Weinstein took notes whispered to his lawyers and paid close attention to every word that was said. Defense lawyer Damon Chironis called the prosecution's opening argument a seductive narrative. It's not true. It's not what happened. It's not real. It's a preview to a movie we're not going to see. He said Weinstein's relations with the women were consensual. Chironis read numerous emails the women sent after their alleged assaults, like this from Jessica Mann. I love you. I always do but I hate feeling like a booty call. Lawyer simple. Gloria Allred predicts cross-examination of the women she represents in this case will be brutal. And that continued communication doesn't mean that retroactively that sexual assault or rape or forced oral copulation did not happen. How you feeling, Harvey? Ultimately, the jury of seven men and five women will have to decide which version of Harvey Weinstein is closest to the truth. Stephen D'Souza, CBC News, New York. Of course, there are so many accusers who will never have their day in court. Like Harvey Weinstein's former assistant, she says he tried to rape her, then shut her up. I really felt I was never going to get away from the secret. Now she's breaking a non-disclosure agreement to tell her story in a Canadian exclusive. The former Canadian reservist calling for civil war in the U.S., where police say he was planning to attack. And the little boy in St. John's who just wanted to help. He came to us. He said, my heart is broken. The moment the military answered the call, we're back into. Welcome back. Leaders from some of Canada's biggest unions joined a Regina picket line today. Their members 
aren't among the workers who've been locked out for 48 days. But as Bonnie Allen found out, they say what is happening outside this oil refinery could resonate across the country. This is our red line for every union in this country. Step up. Union leaders have come from across the country to help barricade one of the largest oil refineries in Canada. They're galvanized in a fight for pension security. If they take away pensions in the private sector, we in the public sector know they're coming after ours next. For three days, this picket line has been beefed up with chain link fences and vehicles with deflated tires. They've blocked fuel trucks and replacement workers, an attempt to shut down business at the co-op oil refinery. Police say it's illegal, but Unifor is defiant. We're standing up for workers' rights. It's doubling down after 14 people were arrested and charged with mischief Monday night, including Unifor's national president, Jerry Dias. I can't go within 500 meters of the refinery. Police have since pulled back, but Dias says it's the first time in 40 years of picketing that he's been arrested. He's prepared to push the limits of the law. Well, if they're going to lock us out and bring in scabs to do our jobs, that is the absolute no-fly zone for the labour movement in this country. In a memo, Unifor told its members that the only reason police backed off was because of the number of picketers. It's counting on a massive presence to hold the line, and the police chief has conceded officers can't arrest them all. We believe that uh, there is a line that which the law can't be broken. Um, we believe that we have to maintain public safety. And, and hasn't so that line been gonna, crossed right now? Yeah, well, it's it's not as easy as just uh, slipping out there with a police car and handling this situation. The company says the union is using an illegal blockade as a bullying tactic. And this fight is costing both sides a lot of money. Today, a judge ruled that Unifor violated a court injunction when it blocked traffic last month. It must pay a fine of $100,000. Bonnie Allen, CBC News, Regina. All right, we've got some breaking news that I want to get to right now. Dan Burrett standing by in our Vancouver newsroom. Dan, what can you tell us? Andrew, it has been a deadly day in downtown Seattle. One person has been killed and several more badly hurt after a shooting in a busy shopping district. And tonight, police are trying to find those responsible. It happened around 5 p.m. outside a fast food restaurant just blocks from Seattle's famous Pike Place Market and near several large department stores. Police, firefighters and paramedics raced to the scene as shots rang out. What we've been able to determine now is that this was not a random incident. There were uh, multiple people involved. There was a dispute that happened in front of the McDonald's. Uh, people pulled out guns, shots rang out, people ran in uh, d various directions. And as you know, um, we had uh, multiple people that were injured. Police say one person was killed at the scene and seven more were rushed to hospital. A woman went into surgery in critical condition while a nine-year-old boy was seriously hurt. Five other people were said to be in stable condition. Witnesses say it was a chaotic scene as people raced for cover. I heard a, few, a series of pops and then a, about a dozen pops. And I saw people running and I saw bodies down. I wasn't sure if they were hurt. Police are now trying to find the suspect or suspects and are looking at surveillance video from nearby stores. This is the third shooting in downtown Seattle in two days. A man died yesterday after he was found shot in a mall stairwell and police shot a person in another part of downtown earlier today. It's not yet clear if any of the shootings are linked. Back to you. Still ahead on The National, the new normal in some Canadian hospitals. Overcrowding so bad, patients are being put in the kitchen and the gym and I feel that we were abandoned. The Canadian families of the Ethiopian crash say they've been forgotten and the government agrees. The details in two. Canada is strong, an online campaign to help the families who lost loved ones. On Ukrainian Airlines Flight 752, just got a major government boost. Today, I would like to announce that the government of Canada will match donations to this fund up to $1.5 million. Now, Canada Strong, started by a Toronto-based businessman, has so far raised nearly $600,000. The government has already begun dispersing $25,000 payments to the families of the 57 citizens and 29 permanent residents who died. It's also facilitating the return of remains from Iran.
Now that's immediate help for those facing immense suffering. But 10 months before that tragedy, 18 Canadians died on Ethiopian's airline flight 302. Ottawa's reaction to that disaster was different. Ashley Burke spoke to a family left to grapple with the aftermath, largely on their own. After more than 10 months of grief, a logistical nightmare and little government help, this is what the Moors have left of their daughter. A box of her belongings from the plane crash. We can still smell the aviation, aviation fuel. fuel. A stark reminder of the crash that killed their 24-year-old Danielle, who was on her way to a UN conference in Kenya. The Boeing 737 MAX 8 crashed six minutes after takeoff. There were no survivors. You have so many guilt as a parent. I was there to hold her hands <laughs> on that six minutes of horrific. Was she calling us? Was she calling me? Families of the 18 Canadian victims have struggled through a long, complicated process. That's all we've been faced with here are roadblocks. Roadblocks like trying to get a death certificate from Ethiopia, then the daunting task of repatriation, and the haunting reality that not all of her remains were found. Canada provided nothing beyond consular services. I feel that we were abandoned. Um, it takes um, 10 months for our Canadian government to even have a meeting with us. We need to be better in terms of openness and transparency with the families. The government says it learned from this month's tragedy in Iran and will give more help to families of the Ethiopia crash too. You know, Minister Garneau is committed to that. Uh, to hear what their needs are uh, so that we can uh, go forward and provide what the families need. They want to know what Canada knew about the troubled Boeing 737 MAX airliners so they can stop reliving that day. I, I, I don't think so that I could ever move on. My life is always be on the March the 10th. We feel so alone. I feel so alone and so lost. So lost they can't bring themselves to open the rest of their daughter's belongings. Ashley Burke, CBC News, Ottawa. Now, the Ethiopia crash was the second involving the Boeing 737 MAX, after which the plane was grounded. Production recently halted, but now we're learning that won't last long. Boeing says the MAX will be back in production within months. At least one of the fatal crashes was linked to design flaws in the plane's flight control system. But Boeing expects regulators to clear the MAX to fly by the middle of this year. Coming up, Harvey Weinstein was her boss until she says he tried to rape her. It was a pretty terrifying experience. Weinstein demanded her silence and for two decades she complied. But now, even as he faces trial, his threats continue. Her story, next. Earlier, we showed you the opening arguments in the criminal trial of Harvey Weinstein. This began with a story in the New York Times, women accusing the movie mogul of sexual misconduct. That was two years ago, and it launched a formidable movement. Weinstein might have been brought to trial long before this, if not for his use of non-disclosure agreements or NDAs. They can muzzle alleged victims and keep their stories from being told. Tonight, Rowena Chu, silenced for more than 20 years by an NDA, takes the risk of speaking out, shedding the bonds of secrecy, a key step in the Me Too movement. Rowena Chu is finally stepping into the light. She wanted to before, but couldn't, and she's still taking a chance. What happened that made you decide it's okay to talk? I think it was a very, very long journey. To speak today, it's another breaking of my NDA, which is still technically illegal. So it is still frightening. But I think as well as the legal repercussions, the personal repercussions to me were very powerful as a silencer. This is a woman with the story of a time that broke her life daughter of Chinese immigrants, graduate of Oxford University, who fresh out of school landed a dream job in the 90s at Miramax as an assistant to Harvey Weinstein. It was supposed to be the great beginning. You have a dream, a 
That's right. And you get this hu this yeah. huge job. Yeah. You must have been thrilled? Yes, absolutely. I was thrilled. Um, I appreciated the opportunity to travel. Um, some of the work would focus around traveling with Harvey to various European film festivals. So overall, it was an exciting position to kind of, I felt like at a young age, we would have a say. We would, um, you know, be influencing the next film that Miramax funded. Now, working for Harvey specifically was rumoured to be very difficult. Um, we knew that he had a legendary temper, we knew that he was a difficult person to deal with. Um, I certainly didn't go into the job thinking um, he's a serial rapist. Were there any concrete tips, though, about how to sort of physically protect yourself from him? Well, there had been rumours, of course, about, you know, to wear more clothes around Harvey Weinstein. I wore two pairs of tights as a response to those kind of jokes. And I thought, well, it won't do any harm if I've got extra layers of clothing on, and if something terrible were to happen, um, it may buy me some time. That, according to Chu, was a sadly wise call. 1998, the Venice Film Festival. Chu is assigned the night shifts with Weinstein. The more senior assistant, Zelda Perkins, takes the early shifts. Perkins had warned Chu about Weinstein, but both women thought all would be okay. Chu tells us it wasn't okay. Typically, the evening shifts were pretty difficult because I would be alone with Harvey, uh, Zelda would not be in the room, and so there would definitely be requests for inappropriate sexual contact during that time. You know, there is very much a sense that he would combine uh, work that we were doing on the scripts with more personal questions, uh, and inappropriate requests, really. So, you know, one minute he'd be asking me my view on a certain film script and whether or not I thought it was a great story and how strong the characterization was. And then the next minute he'd be asking for a massage and so on. Is there relevance to, to your ethnicity and your background in, in your interactions with Harvey? Did, did he make that an issue? He mentioned how he liked Chinese girls because they were discreet. Um, and he would say that in public, but then in private, you know, that would be twisted around to be, um, you know, that he'd never had a Chinese girl and that he wanted to try and this kind of thing. Because the, the subtext is really, I like your discretion because you're not going to complain about me, whatever I do to you. It's, it's a sort of dangerous subtext. It's a dangerous subtext, I think. Can I ask you, and again, you don't have to tell me, but can I ask you what, what happened on what is arguably the night? Uh, we uh, talked a bit about scripts. We spent some time discussing, uh, you know, he engaged in some flattery about how I graduated from with a degree in English literature from Oxford, which he very much liked to allude to also. Um, he asked me a bit about my boyfriend. He asked me um, how long we'd been together and whether he was my first boyfriend and so on. And so I guess the conversation segued into the personal very quickly. Um, he asked me for a massage. Um, he had taken his clothes off, so he was naked. Mm -hmm. So he requested a massage from me, which I was reluctant to give him. Um, he asked me to take off um, some of my layers of clothing, saying that it was warm in the hotel room or that I'd feel more comfortable if I took off more clothes. And so in that way, it was almost an insidious, you know, gradual um, uh, path towards, you know, asking for more and more um, overt sexual favours um, and so it, from there it led to him pinning me against the bed and and asking for just one thrust and saying just one thrust and it'll all be over. Oh my god, your head must have been swimming. It was a pretty terrifying experience. She says it was a lot to handle. At the first chance she describes having a quiet urgent word with Zelda Perkins to tell her what happened. In fact I think we both cried. Um, Zelda went to confront Harvey right away, which I think was an incredibly brave thing to do. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think many people in her position at 25 and as Harvey's assistant would have the courage to go down and to speak to him right away when he's at lunch with such high profile people. The women had a plan. Back in London, they would sound the alarm with the company hoping Weinstein would be rebuked, forced to undergo counseling. Maybe rules would be put in place for working with women. But they say the lawyers were just interested in something different, compensation for silence. The non-disclosure agreement they signed haunts them still. How would you characterize the silence they were seeking? Like, how sweeping was it? 
absolute, absolute. We were told that this period of our lives would have to be considered a black hole. We could, in the lightest possible terms, refer to the fact that we had worked for Harvey Weinstein, but we weren't to go into any detail about the nature of that work or what happened subsequent to that work or the fact that there was an NDA or the fact that there was any settlement money. None of that was to be referred to. In fact, it felt so onerous that Zelda and I implicitly made a pact that we wouldn't speak to one another, and we didn't after the journey in the taxi away from the law firm once we'd signed the NDA the next time I heard from Zelda was October 2017, and we'd signed that agreement in October 1998. So it's almost 20 years. Yeah, 19 years to the month that we had not spoken to one another. Did you know w when you parted in that taxi that you wouldn't talk? I think there was a clear sense that we wouldn't remain in each other's lives because we talked about how difficult it was not to refer to this period of our lives. But what's it like to lose the one person who stood beside you the whole time? I think it was incredibly difficult. Um, but not just that I had lost the only colleague that I could talk to about it, but an inability to speak to anyone in my personal life about really quite a traumatic event meant really it wasn't possible to process it. I'm wondering how much a secret like this weighs. Clearly a great deal. Um, because I found it an impossible burden to bear, really, um, and it came to a point where I tried to kill myself a couple of times, and I really felt I was never going to get away from the secret. You, you are calm, almost matter-of-fact about what happened, and, and w where does that calm come from? Um, you know, I think being British and being Chinese uh, it means that I'm not necessarily too transparent. Um, but I think that sounding calm doesn't necessarily mean it wasn't a, a really frightening experience. So was the screaming inside your head? There is screaming inside my head from at the time of the assault, absolutely. I still feel powerless. Zelda and I are now in our mid-40s and yet there's still no remedy in the legal world, or there doesn't appear to be a, a remedy available to us in the legal world. Who knows what will happen with the criminal trial, but, um, you know, t telling a story in the media publicly isn't necessarily an easy fix to everything that has taken place. Time, the effort of journalists to find them, the launch of the Me Too movement, all of this collided to bring the two women back together again. Zella Perkins, Rowena Chu. You know, I'd like to say that Zelda and Rowena are here tonight and speaking in active violation of this NDA and this settlement. They found their voices, both choosing to break their NDAs. It all might intimidate some back into the shadows, but not Rowena Chu, not anymore. How did Harvey Weinstein respond to you telling your story? Um, his lawyer issued a statement saying that um, Harvey Weinstein and I had engaged in a six-month physical consensual relationship and that Harvey was looking for ways to take legal action against me for breaking my NDA. Is it worth it for you? We'll see. Uh, I'm on a long journey. Um, I am, you know, encouraged by the voices that lift me up from other victims, but also from people who are silent even to this day, and they feel like I in some way speak for them. I won't know the long-term repercussions of speaking out for a long time to come, but I so far have no regrets. And it's wonderful to meet you, Marina. Thank Lovely you very, to meet you very too. much. Thank you for your time. I very much appreciate that. We asked Weinstein's lawyers to respond to Rowena Chu's allegations, and we finally received this statement from his public relations company. Quote, neither Mr. Weinstein nor his representatives will be making any comments on these matters. I hope you can remain objective. And up next, hospitals so busy, so crowded, patients are being treated in unusual places. This was a pantry. Uh, it used to have a fridge and a nice maker and a microwave. This is not the optimal place to be providing care. 
And it's not just during flu season, the ripple effect clogging yeah, hospitals. I'm Jamie Poisson, and tomorrow on CBC's Daily News podcast, Front Burner, as the EU expresses interest in a moratorium on facial recognition technology, we discuss its use and its potential for abuse. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. A bit of hospital overcrowding during flu season is nothing new, but a CBC News investigation has revealed that, in fact, so-called hallway medicine is happening nearly every single day in hospitals across Ontario. Mike Crawley shows us the extreme measures hospitals are taking to find space. This used to be an exercise gym. Now it's a makeshift hospital ward with no bathroom, little privacy, and beds separated by portable screens. I'm just going to check your oxygen and everything, okay, while I'm here. South Lake Regional Health Centre is a 500-bed hospital in Newmarket, north of Toronto. Its overcrowding affects patients from the moment they arrive in the ER. Stayed in emergency for probably almost two days, I guess, until they finally got me what you see here, these lovely accommodations. New data obtained by CBC News show Ontario's hallway medicine problem is not just confined to the Toronto area. From January to June last year, all these hospitals were filled beyond capacity nearly every single day. So we've got warning signs going off all over the province and the situation just isn't viable. It's forcing hospitals to put beds in all kinds of spots. This former kitchenette will soon be a patient room. We don't have the same access to the equipment as you would on a set up acute medical floor. No one at the hospital likes it this way, from the nurses to the CEO. When I see patients in areas uh, such as our gym, is I think about what, how would I feel if that was my dad in that bed? And um, I wouldn't feel that good about it. Another hospital, also near Toronto. Weekday afternoons are pretty quiet in the ER. Still, there are patients in the hall and beside the nursing station. For our staff who work in this environment, they would describe it as constantly working under crisis. The hospital put beds in this meeting room. Ten patients here share one washroom with no shower. Ontario Premier Doug Ford has promised to end hallway health care. His health minister admits it'll take years. There's no simple solution to change it. There's a lot of action that needs to be taken, and we are doing that. One of the big causes of overcrowding, about one in six hospital beds is occupied by a patient who doesn't need acute care. They're mostly waiting for space in long-term care, something in short supply for Ontario's growing and aging population. Mike Crawley, CBC News, Newmarket, Ontario. Up next, a simple plea that triggered a military response. How a St. John's boy housebound from the blizzard became an honorary recruit. That's next. Like so many others in Newfoundland, Matthew Sharp really wanted to help out after the blizzard, but the seven-year-old lives with cerebral palsy and his mom worried that so much snow might just not be safe for him. So Matthew wanted to get out there to help the soldiers he saw shoveling. Instead, a surprise at his front door. They came to him, and that's our moment. Well, Matthew has cerebral palsy. He came to walk. Then he's seen the military. He said, Mommy, he said, my heart is broken. I wants to go out and help the, he calls it the war people. And he looked at me and he said, Mommy, he said, can the military come and help me? It was the first time I ever took to Facebook for any help. And they knocked at the door and Matthew was like, Mommy, who is it? I guess it was um, quite the reaction from the little boy. Uh, <laughs> getting a bit choked up, I guess. Um, it was nice to see such enthusiasm and so appreciative of what everyone's doing and how everyone's working together and being so helpful, you know? I'm just happy I could be involved with it, you know what I mean? See, and see that, the smile on the little boy's face when we showed up. You couldn't understand him, he was that excited. <laughs> I didn't expect this today. <laughs> you know, uh, Matthew, firstly, good for you for mm. wanting to help. Uh, you're a great Newfoundlander, a great Canadian. Um, it, it, his mom, Matthew's mom, Lisa, says that he's really very, very shy. But as soon as the soldiers showed up, they, they really 
took to him. He really took to them. You can see by the, the by the emotion. Yeah, up in their arms, the Absolutely. big hug. And I, I, I mean, the only sad thing is that they couldn't actually stay for very long. I mean, they've, they've got work to do, right? They had to get right back out there. But they said, hey, maybe we'll be back in the spring off from a, a ride in their truck. And uh, great. Yeah, it'll be part two of the visit. Maybe we'll do another moment that day. I'd like it. Uh, that's The National for this January 22nd. Have a great night. Good night.